This is the lecture on physics prerequisites, which is mostly electricity that you should have learned when you were taking PS 104, which most of you have forgotten since then. I encourage you to get out the white pages and take lots of notes, and then when you're done, go to the yellow pages and make sure you can answer all of the questions in preparation for the test as assigned and scheduled in the syllabus. Electrons. They're really small. They're negatively charged. They go really fast. They go the speed of light, which is really amazingly fast. 186,000 statute miles per second. That's 186,000 statute miles per second. It's about 250,000 miles one way to the moon, so that's a 500,000 mile round trip. 500,000 statute miles divided by 186,000 statute miles is about three seconds round trip. That's really stinking fast. In the metric system, it, that would be 300 million meters per second. That's 300, comma, 000, comma, 000, uh, meters per second. There, I already told you they're negatively charged. And if you have too many electrons, you'll have something that's negatively charged, say a negative ion. If you take electrons off of a molecule or an atom, and there's more protons than there are neutrons, correction, more protons than there are electrons, then it'll be positively charged. And of course, the negative electrons are attracted to where there's not enough, to where there's uh, positive ions. Uh, when electrons flow through a conductor, of course in airplanes most of the conductors are aluminum and copper wires, uh, some of that energy is used up in the wire and the wire gets hotter. Also, some of that energy is used up by creating magnetic lines of flux. Uh, just so you know, only when the electrons are moving through the wire is the wire then turned into an electromagnet. When you turn off the amps or the electrons going through the wire, the lines of flux will collapse. There's two basic types of electricity we're concerned with in aircraft. One is direct current and the other is alternating current. In direct current, the electrons only flow in one direction. In alternating current, they flow in one direction and then they can move in the opposite direction. So we'll draw a nice simple circuit. Here's a battery. And we'll put an ammeter in it. And we'll put a light bulb in the circuit. And in a battery, if you see the electrical symbol for battery, the short side is negatively charged. The long lines are the positive side of the battery. And all these negative electrons over here are going to try to get to the other side of the battery where there's not enough. So they're all going to go in this direction through the light bulb and to the positive side of the battery. And the battery will slowly discharge. This is a DC circuit in that the current only flows in one direction. And a light bulb doesn't really care, but if you put in, instead of a light bulb, you put in uh, a radio instead. Radios like current flowing only in one direction. If you've ever hooked up a stereo, you know the red wire, whoops, the red wire usually goes to the negative side of the battery, and the black wire goes to, whoops, I got these backwards. The black wire goes to the negative side or ground and the red wire. Well, you can see it's pretty easy to hook up your stereo in your car backwards and have it fry and emit smoke, which is, you know, when you put it back in the box and take it back to the, shop, the store and say, uh, it's busted, give me another one. That's direct current. Alternating current is, it comes out of a generator. There's no such thing as an AC battery. It doesn't store alternating current. That's the electrical symbol for a, here's an ammeter, and here's a light bulb again. In alternating current, of course light bulbs, they work off of AC or DC. Uh, in alternating current, half of the time electrons go in one direction. If we had an ammeter like in a 172, it has polarity like plus 30 and minus 30. When electrons go in one direction, then uh, the, whoops, 
the current will flow, show slightly in one direction. But that's for only 50% of the time. Then uh, the electrons stop flowing in that direction, and they flow in the opposite direction. Wow, I'm getting pretty good at this erasing stuff. The electrons flow in the opposite direction. And our needle, oops, our needle will show that the electrons are flowing in the opposite direction. Now, although you'll notice here that it shows a negative and a positive plus minus plus and minus 30, that's not the polarity of the electrons. That's just the negative direction. In fact, we could graph it. You don't need to draw this at the moment. But the uh, whoops, for alternating current, if we had a chart and across the bottom is time, and here we had amps, and here's no amps flowing, and here's some in one direction, here's some in the other, we could plot uh, across, say, for instance, 400th of, 400th of a second in an airplane. It's uh, 1 400th of a second for alternating current in your household current. It's 1 60th of a second for one sine wave to occur. So in this half right here, electrons are going in one direction, the positive direction. And for this amount of time right here, the electrons are going in the opposite direction and the needle would be pointing in the opposite direction. So alternating current, half the time the electrons flow in one direction, half the time they flow in the opposite direction. Electrical circuits. You need three things to make things work in an electrical circuit. You need a source of electrons like a battery or a generator of some kind, an alternator. We'll get to those differences in class. You need a load, something to use the electricity. It could be a light bulb. It could be a motor. It could be lots of different things. And you need a conductor, which in airplanes is either the wire or the uh, the airframe, if it's made out of metal. Whoops. See if I can spell airframe right. It is on my mechanic certificate, after all. Um, the airframe is made out of metal typically and so we're going to use it as a conductor and so again if I drew a nice simple circuit we'd have all of the components we'd have the source we'd have a conductor or conductors and we'd have a load to use up the whoops use up the electrical power current flowing. It's measured in amps. Uh, sometimes it's used, uh, labeled as capital I, sometimes capital A. I tend to go back and forth. I don't care which way you label it. Uh, it I also call it current. Uh, the long spelling of the word amps is amperes. I don't think anybody says amperes anymore. You do not, I repeat, do not need to memorize this number, but current flow or amps is measured in how many electrons go past a certain point in a second, 6.28 times 10 to the 18th. That's a whole lot of stinking electrons uh, going past a certain point in a second. Of course, electron flow is from negative to positive. The old conventional theory a long time ago, you know, <laughs> 100 years ago, it's like, oh, wait, electrons go from positive to negative, but they figured out that was incorrect. They go from where there's too many electrons to where there's not enough electrons. Um, amperage or current flow is similar if you start thinking about the comparing or using water a water pipe system like in your house as an analogy to an electrical system water uh, gallons per hour or gallons per minute is very similar to amperage it's measuring a quantity in a certain amount of time and if you don't have a complete circuit the amps won't move. So, for instance, if we have a battery, and here's our light bulb, and our conductor is not long enough, current can't flow. So here we have an incomplete circuit or an open circuit, and so electrons won't flow. In this case, the amperage, if we'd stuck an ammeter in here, it would be stuck at zero. Resistance is measured in ohms. Sometimes I'll write it as a capital R or you can use the Greek letter omega. It means uh, 
opposition to current flow. It tries to stop electrons. You need to understand that electrons are either going to travel at the speed of light or they're not. They don't slow down for practical purposes for pilots in wires. They either go or they don't. So if you have enough resistance or your ohms goes up, it doesn't slow the same number of electrons down. It just stops some of them. So the total number of electrons that are actually moving is less. If you may have had a water pipe and you had a certain amount of volume or quantity of, of uh, mo water, water molecules traveling through it and you Oops, this will be interesting. I guess it'll probably get rid of that whole line. And you made a restriction in it, or made the water pipe smaller. And now we have a small area here instead of a large area. Less water is going to be able to go through it. So whatever water molecules came up here, they're going to tend to stop. Uh, the, the analogy between water and electricity isn't perfect. With water, it would just spew through faster, but electrons only travel at a certain speed, the speed of light, so uh, resistance would just stop some of the electrons. So this would be a high resistance because it stopped lots of electrons. Whoops. So you can change the resistance of a conductor by changing what that conductor is made out of. For instance, copper and aluminum or what airplane wires are typically made out of. Little airplanes, they're all copper. On bigger airplanes, copper is used where they're going to bend a lot because if you bend aluminum wire too much, it ends up cracking. But aluminum weighs less. Uh, the area, the bigger the, the area, the, gr the greater amount of electrons can travel through it. So if you have a wire that's a very large diameter, it has less resistance. Just like a water pipe that was bigger in area could have more water going through it. A wire that has a bigger area could have more electrons going through it. Um, how long it is. If you double the length, you'll double the resistance. Just like if you double, uh, cut the area in half of a wire and got rid of half of the wire, the resistance here would be twice as much. If you took a certain length of wire and you doubled it, the wire that was longer would have two times the resistance. And my personal favorite is temperature. Most conductors, if you heat them up, the resistance goes up. So if you start your car or your airplane and the wire going out to the starter motor gets hotter and hotter and hotter, it actually has higher resistance so less electrons can go through it when it gets hotter. Those are the four factors that affect the resistance of a conductor. Electrical pressure is typically called volts. You can use capital letter V, or that I'm going to probably use the capital letter E most of the time. It's the push. How much pressure is there behind those electrons? Um, it's similar to water pressure, say, in your house. The higher the water pressure coming into your house, the more volume of water can get into the house. So the higher the, the electrical voltage, or the higher the electrical pressure, the more amps can get pushed through the same wire. Uh, if you have, for instance, that battery again, and just like in the last one, we have an incomplete circuit, or it's open. Whoops, can't spell N. And let's say we hooked a voltmeter up to measure the voltage of this battery. You know, in a seminal, it's going to read 12.6 volts if the brand battery is brand new and fully charged. We have a voltage, we have pressure but no electrons are flowing. So we can have voltage without uh, or pressure without having a complete circuit. Ohm's law, you probably remember Ohm's law. Let's see if I can remember it. Of course I always use E over IR. E for volts, I is for current, and R is for resistance. But if you'd rather use uh, V for volts and A for amps and R for resistance, that would be fine. Uh, as long as you know two of these variables, you can calculate it for, uh, you can calculate the third variable. Of course, if you'd rather use uh, ohms or use omega. Does anybody see the movie Omega Man? Charlton Heston, a really campy, poor science fiction movie. I highly recommend you watch it. In any case, Let's take a circuit here, and then let's try a battery. 
and just for f yeah, let's see we'll put a light bulb in it we'll make it nice and easy and we'll say that this battery puts out 10 volts and this light bulb has 2 ohms of resistance so we can and we so therefore we want to find out amps all we have to do is cover up what we want and it's volts divided by resistance so amps equals volts divided by resistance you see you see how this right here is the same as this right here so in this case amps is volts divided by r so that's 10 divided by 2 equals 5 amps so that means that 5 amps if we put an ammeter in here the needle would go over to 5 amps or you could say 5 amps is going through this and whoops it's going in this direction this is the negative side this is the positive side amps are going to go from negative to positive. Wow, it's as if I learned this in some class somewhere. So if you use this formula, Ohm's Law, you can do questions 1 through 9 pretty easily. And the point of doing this is not because you need to be really good at using Ohm's Law as a pilot, but that I want you to well understand the relationship between volts and ohms and amps so that when you look at a circuit and go, okay, the battery's pushing 10 volts, it's got 2 ohms of resistance, you're going to be able to think, okay, amps is volts over resistance, and come up at the answer pretty rapidly, or just for fun, like this. Let's say this wasn't 2 ohms, and it, but it was 4 ohms, so we doubled the opposition to current flow. If we doubled the opposition, then that's going to cut our amperage in half. So if it used to be 5, now it's going to be 2.5 that's what would be good for you to be able to do. So the start is by doing practice questions 1 through 9. Power in electrical circuits is measured in watts. Uh, you can use capital W, you can use capital P for watts. It's work getting done. Even if you don't see anything moving, things are moving. Power is getting used. Just because you have a light bulb and nothing moves, in some terms in physics, work only gets done if something moves. Well, we're moving electrons and we're converting electrical energy into photons in a light bulb. Power is definitely getting used up in that case. Um, I'll probably draw the formula P equals I times E, but if you'd rather use watts equals amps times volts, that's okay with me. Um, I'm interested in you understanding that there's a relationship between watts and horsepower. For instance, if you had a one horsepower motor, it would take approximately 746 watts of electrical power. Now, in reality, electric motors aren't 90% efficient. If you gave it 746 watts and it was 90% efficient, you'd probably only get 0.9 horsepower, but if we don't worry about the inefficiencies of electric motors for a moment, you could say if a device used 746 watts, it's, it's, uh, if it was a motor, it could develop about one horsepower. And of course, here's the formula, which uh, just like, just so you know, on the test, I will give you this formula right here, so you don't have to memorize the formula. Is that going to be okay if you don't have to memorize a formula? Same thing here. I will give you this formula right here on the test, and I will give you this formula right here on the test. Just for fun, let's try something, and let's just say we got a battery and an electric motor. It's rather interesting trying to draw with this thing. Electrons, there's too many electrons on this side, there's not enough electrons on this side, so the electrons are going to go from negative to positive, they're going to go through that electric motor, the battery's going to discharge, and that energy going through the motor is going to be used up and converted from electrical power into kinetic energy, or rotating energy. So just for fun, let's say this motor has 0.1 ohm of resistance, and let's say that this battery is a 25.2 volts battery, which is brand new fully charged the battery in a 28 volt system like the 172 well let's see power equals I times E but we don't have current flow we don't have the current flow but you know what we could solve it we could use Ohm's law to solve it E over IR and in this case volts is 25.2 
and divide it by the resistance, 0.1, that's going to equal 25, 2, because we just need to move the decimal over 1. 25.2 amps. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo. -hoo -hoo. So, we solved for I, so I equals E over R. That's what I did there. So now we know that there's 25, 252 amps going through the circuit. Okay, well now for power, power equals 252 times 25.2. And let's see, 25 times 25, I believe, is 625. And we add another decimal. So it's going to be somewhere around 6,250 watts of power. Okay. So horsepower, if we wanted to know how much horsepower this motor was producing, under the assumption that it's 100% efficient, horsepower is watts, which we have 6,250 watts, approximately, divided by 746. 7 goes into 62, about, uh, let's see, 8, 9, 9 times, we'll say 8.5. So horsepower is about 8.5. So, wow, so this electric motor, this sounds like a starter motor to me, and this might be uh, on a 172, 200, or correction, 25.2 volts. The motor has a very, very small resistance, so it will allow lots and lots of amps to go through it, which means it will develop lots of power, and this power can be converted into horsepower. So now you ought to be able to do some more practice questions that involve, whoops, that involve horsepower and watts. Magnetic fields, yay. Magnetic fields, uh, the lines of flux emanating from them have polarity. If we have a north pole and a south pole, we're going to have lines of flux coming off of this magnet. If we stick another magnet next to it, put a south pole and a north pole, these lines of flux have polarity. They're both south, excuse me, and like uh, poles repel each other. So this is going to get one of the you know one of the magnets is going to end up moving. Of course, if we reversed it, and this was the north pole, then these two would attract. Oops. Yeah. Uh, so they definitely have polarity. North and south poles, opposite poles attract, like poles repel. Wow, it's like I knew this stuff. The strength of the field is determined. That's the magnetic field. is determined by how many flux lines there are in a volume per unit of volume or you could describe that as flux density Oops. so for instance if we have a magnet let's just say we have two magnets we have two magnets and we have one here and we have an identical magnet same strength right here now these, this thing is going to be able to pick up paper clips. The question becomes how many paper clips can it pick up? Can you guess which one of these is if we put the paper clips right here and we put paper clips right here, how which one would be able to pick up more? If you've done this experiment before, you know that you can pick up more by picking it up at the poles because there is more lines of flux concentrated in a certain amount of volume on the pole than there is on the edge. Here, right here, if we take one cubic inch of volume, there's only one line in here. However, right here, whoops, this didn't come out very well. There we go. One cubic inch of space right here 
as this line of flux and it has this lines of flux. So it has twice as many lines of flux in it, so we're going to be able to pick up twice as many paper clips. So it's not that the magnet's any stronger, it's just that the lines of flux are concentrated and we have a higher flux density. That is, we have more lines of flux per volume. You can make permanent magnets out of three things, either iron or cobalt and nickel, or nickel, if you look on the periodic table of elements, you'll find that they're all right next to each other. They have very similar properties. You can magnetize iron or cobalt or nickel. Cobalt and nickel are all very expensive compared to iron, so you're only going to see permanent magnets on airplanes made out of iron. Now, you got it can't be pure iron. If it's absolutely 100% pure, you can't permanently magnetize it. But if you put, say, some carbon in it, and that... Uh, that contaminant allows the iron to be uh, permanently magnetized. Okay, you can also have electromagnets. Electromagnets are anything that has electricity going through it during the time period that electrons are traveling through this conductor, usually a wire, then you will have lines of flux. But the lines of flux don't just instantaneously appear and instantaneously disappear. For instance, if we have a switch here, here's a single pole, single throw switch, and we'll say we have a coil of wire, whoops, wrapped up, and this switch closes. If we graft this in time, and let's say we put an ammeter in there, and we also measure the size of the flux, so if we have amps, amps are going to rise and they're going to level off, and then they're going to stay constant. and during that same period of time the lines of flux are going to rise and then stay constant but this right here this takes a very small but a certain amount of time and if we turned the switch off ah darn it oh well if we turn the switch off No, it's not going to come back. Oh, well. If we turn the switch off, then the lines of flux will drop. Let's see how fast I can draw that back. Oops. One more time. Here's our switch. It's closed right now, and it's allowing current to flow. And here's what we had going. We had our amps. And, or rather our lines of flux and we had our amps and the size of our flux. If we open the switch and stop current flow then amps are going to drop but it's going to take a certain amount of time the lines of flux are going to drop so this right here again takes a very small amount of time and so therefore these lines of flux are going to start in the middle of the wire and they're going to get bigger and they're going to get bigger and get bigger and get bigger and get bigger till they get to this point and then they're going to stay the same size assuming this is direct current and then we have a fixed resistance you know Ohm's law if the volts are constant say we have a battery that's putting out a constant voltage and we have a constant resistance in the wires and in this coil, this electromagnet, then the amps will be constant too. As soon, you know, this time right here may be a thousandth of a second or something. So as the amps are rising, the lines of flux will rise, and then as the amps are level and constant amount, so will the flux lines be a constant amount. So these flux lines will just sit there until we open the switch. When you open the switch, the lines of flux will collapse. The lines of fl the amps, because the amps will go down, and the lines of flux will go down, and that again takes a certain amount of time. Okay, now I'm going to erase it. There we go. What can be attracted by magnets? Guess what? Iron, cobalt, and nickel are the only thing that can be permanent magnets, and iron, cobalt, or nickel are the only things that can be attracted by magnets, or at least you got to have some of that inside of your metal. Um, if you are a magnet, you can attract or repel other magnets, whether they're permanent magnets or electromagnets, doesn't make any difference.
properties of magnetism. A couple more here. Permeability. Air versus iron. If we have, uh, well, let's see, let's try it like this. If we have an electromagnet, and we have a certain amount of lines of flux, they're going to go through the air. However, iron has uh, 7,000 times greater permeability than iron does. That is, uh, lines of flux would rather go through iron 7,000 times more than it would through air. If we then took in this coil and uh, put in, say, for instance, a chunk of iron in the middle, instead of these lines of flux wanting to go outside here in the air, they would much rather go inside of the iron. So the lines of flux would mostly stay in the iron. And so guess what would happen right here in this cubic centimeter, a very small volume right here, the lines of flux would be concentrated. Oops, can't spell concentrated. So we can use iron, or it would be cobalt or nickel, but again, iron's a lot cheaper. And we can stick that inside of a coil of wire, and it pulls the lines of flux in so they're nice and concentrated which means that it acts like it's a stronger magnet. Retentivity. Retentivity, oh, well, just for fun. Permeability is the ease at which lines of flux will travel through a substance. The ease, E-A-S-E. -E. Uh, the ease at which lines of flux will travel through a substance. Retentivity is how many lines of flux will remain after you turn off the magnetizing force. If we have an electromagnet, I'm starting to get good at this, and we turn this on and we've got lines of flux coming out of it. Um, if we open the circuit and we break, we cut the wire, so no amps can flow through the, through the magnet, then these lines of flux will collapse down to zero. And if this wire is made out of copper or aluminum or gold or titanium or whatever, it will have zero retentivity. That is, only cobalt, nickel, or iron has any retentivity at all. If we had, uh, if this wire was made out of iron, cobalt, or nickel, we'd have some lines of flux. Hard iron, they put carbon in it. In fact, carbonated steel. Carbonated steel, I wonder if that's a term. Iron with, iron with carbon in it is what we call steel. It makes it a little more brittle, but it's a lot stronger. Soft iron has very low retentivity, and that's 100% iron. And like I said before, the only time co nickel, cobalt, or iron will have any retentivity is if you, c you contaminate it a little bit and of course you can contaminate it with steel I mean with carbon which makes it nice because it turns it into steel so if you see something that has high retentivity which means if it has high retentivity that means it's a permanent magnet then guess what they did to it they put carbon in it and turned it into steel and then they magnetized it if it's not iron cobalt or nickel, it doesn't have any retentivity at all. So if you're just making an electromagnet out of aluminum or copper, when you turn off the electricity, then the lines of flux will completely collapse and the retentivity will be zero. How do you change the strength of an electromagnet? The electromagnets are the ones that we're concerned about with on airplanes because there's lots of electromagnets on airplanes. You can either have more windings. If we make a winding up and say we have four windings or identical wire and we have 16 windings and we pump the same amount of amps through it, each one of these coils is going to give off a certain amount of lines of flux. So whichever has the greater coils is going to be a stronger magnet. The shape of the winding. If we have a big giant winding like this, it spreads out. The lines of flux are not concentrated. The lines of flux are way out like this. But if we did an identical number of a coil with an identical number of windings, it uh, 
its lines of flux would be concentrated. So we'd have more in a given volume than we would right here. Whoops. So this one would be stronger. But you know what? On air, uh, also permeable core. I already. Whoops. Didn't do that one very well. Permeable core. If we take a chunk of iron and stick it down into this electromagnet instead of the lines of flux being all spread out, they're going to be all concentrated inside of the iron, and that's going to increase the practical strength of the electromagnet. Then, of course, my personal favorite is if you pump more amps through the electromagnet. If you have this electromagnet and you run, we'll say, one amp through it, and it'll pick up two uh, paper clips. If you then run two amps through it, it'll pick up twice as many. It'll pick up four. So there's a direct relationship. If you double the amperage, then you will double how many paper clips you can pick up. And this one right here, once the magnet or the electromagnet is installed in the airplane, the only way you can really change the strength of it is by changing how many amps. You can't put more windings, change the shape, or add a permeable core in flight because the thing's already manufactured, built, and installed in the airplane. So if we want to change the strength of an electromagnet in an airplane, this is the way we're going to do it. We're going to change how many amps goes through it. EMI, uh, an abbreviation for that is electromagnetic induction. You need three things for electromagnetic induction. Well, what is electromagnetic induction? That's how you convert uh, kinetic energy or rotating energy into electrical energy. To do that, you need three things. You need uh, a coil of wire. So here's a coil of wire. And you need lines of flux. So if we put a magnet over here, we could have some lines of flux coming off of it. And the third thing you need is relative motion between the two. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to move this thing. Let's say we push the lines the magnet in and just for fun we'll uh hook this up to an ammeter. And we'll make it just like a one seventy two again. Plus thirty on this side, minus thirty on this side. And we'll put a voltmeter on it just for fun. We'll measure the voltage potential between one side of the magnet and the other. If, as we push the magnet in, we're always going to have a voltage. It's going to induce voltage in one direction. Since we have a complete circuit, it's also going to allow current flow. So current flow is going to go in a certain direction. If we change the direction of the battery and then pull it out, the lines of flux crossing the wire in the opposite direction is going to induce current flow in the opposite direction than it did before, and the amps will go in the opposite direction. But the only time amps are moving, the only time this will be off of zero, one way or the other, or if this is a voltmeter and, the, and the, we measure a, a voltage, the only time these needles are going to be anywhere off of zero is during the motion. Electromagnetic induction only occurs when we have this relative motion, when the lines of flux are moving across the wire. As soon as the magnet stops, then we don't have any more current flow. We don't have any more pressure or voltage. We've got to have a coil of uh, uh, conductors. We've got to have lines of flux. And we've got to have this motion. We've got to have relative motion for EMI to occur. And you can always get voltage, even if you open the circuit. You just won't get current flow unless you have a complete circuit. Now, electromagnetic induction. How much, how many amps, how much current you get out of that device, whether it's a generator or an alternator on an airplane, is dependent upon four things. The angle of the flux to the conductor. If we've got a conductor, a wire, and the line here, say a magnet, and we put the magnet sideways. So the lines of flux are parallel to the conductor and we move the magnet across in either direction, no current is going to flow. We've got to cross the wire at a 90 degree angle. So the closer to 90 degrees, the more, the more amps we get. The number of windings. If we have 
a line of uh, conductor with five windings and another conductor with a whole bunch more even though they're the same size we just put more wires in it a line of flux if it crosses it if it crosses ten windings instead of a line of flux crossing five we're going to double the amp output unfortunately both of the, this angle and how many windings are getting crossed once you've bolted, put together an alternator or a generator and bolted it into an airplane or your car you can't change the angle and you can't change how many windings there are so those first two these are designed into the alternator or generator and cannot be changed in flight these two are going to be affected in flight so let's say here's our conductor it's a coil of wire and let's take this magnet for fun and let's spin it around we've got lines of flux coming off of it Oops. and let's spin it around with the engine in our airplane so if we spun this around one time per second we get amps coming out that way amps going out that way and this would occur once per second but if we spun it around instead of one time per second we spun it around at 10 times per second then we'd get this occurring 10 times a second and this occurring 10 times a second so we would literally get 10 times the amps being induced into this coil of wire but it doesn't work out too well in the airplane to change since this generator or alternator magnet is being spun around by the engine we don't really want to have to change engine RPM to get the alternator or generator put out more it's like do you push the throttle forward uh, coming in to land at night and you need the landing light so you need more amps so you don't want to have to push the throttle forward so this one although it will change the output we're not going to use it to control the output what we are going to use to control the output is more or less lines of flux so for instance here's our uh, conductor and instead of using a permanent magnet what if we use an electromagnet and a variable resistor and a battery and here's the diagram or the electrical schematic for a variable resistor now we're going to get lines of flux off of this thing off of this battery and it's going to get rotated by the engine and we have a fixed number of windings the angle that they cross the winding is station is fixed we can't change it the speed is just dependent on what we do with the throttle but now we can change the lines of flux we can rotate this knob or change the resistance and if this resistance gets less then more amps will go through the uh, electromagnet and will get more lines of flux if we doubled the amps if amps were doubled that would give us twice as much flux. If we have twice as many lines of flux crossing the wire, that's going to induce uh, twice as many amps. So if we want more amps, you know, this, this literally, this thing right here is the generator or an alternator on your airplane. If we want to get more amps out of it, all the voltage regulator has to do, and we'll talk a lot more about voltage regulator, all the voltage regulator has to do is let more amps into this electromagnet. We get more lines of flux, it induces more amps, and we can run that to power our landing light. So this last one right here, more lines of flux or having a stronger electromagnet, that's the single way that you use to control the output of an electromagnetic induction device like a generator or an alternator once it's installed in your airplane. Aha! opposition to current flow in an alternating current circuit. I find this very interesting. Uh, you may need to glue your seat yourself to the seat so you don't run away. Uh, there are 
uh, three oppositions current flow in an AC circuit. In addition to resistance, there's inductive reactance, which is abbreviated X sub L. The formula for inductive reactance is 2 times pi times the frequency of the circuit times L. L is Henry's. Oops, I think I better spell capitals. L is in Henry's, and that's essentially the, the size of the inductor. In an AC circuit, an inductor is just a coil, which in a DC circuit would have been a, uh, an electromagnet, but in an AC circuit, it's an inductor. If we had a wire, I'm going to go through this really fast. You can put your pencil down and just watch. If we had a wire and we pushed electricity through it, wow, amps. If we push electricity through this wire, it's going to generate lines of flux. They're going to start from the center of the wire, and if we push more amps through, we're going to get more lines of flux. If we push more amps through, we're going to get more lines of flux. If we push enough amps through it, the lines of flux will actually be on the outside of the wire. Interestingly enough, though, these lines of flux, as they expand outward, are literally crossing the inductor. Wow, electromagnetic induction, we need to have a conductor. We need to have uh, flux, and we need to have relative motion, and we've got all three of those. Here's our conductor, here's our lines of flux, and we have relative motion. Interestingly enough, though, this uh, electromagnetic induction produces amps in the opposite direction of the amps that cause the lines of flux in the first place, so it opposes a current flow. And the effect of these lines of flux will be uh, magnified if we wrap the wire up into a coil. So the bigger the coil, that is the bigger the size of the inductor, that's the value of L, will have more Henry's, which is just the size of the inductor, then the value of uh, inductive reactants will get bigger if the value of the coil gets greater. It's also affected by the frequency of the circuit. You'll notice we're talking about alternating current. If we talk about alternating current, frequency is how many sine waves of electricity do we get per second. In household current, it's 60 times a second. In airplanes, it's 400 times a second. So we'll get one sine wave every 400th of a second. Uh, so that's our frequency. So if we changed the frequency, we would change inductive reactants. Now, inductive reactance causes a phase shift between the volts and the amps. Here's time again. And we'll have amps and we'll have volts. Remember, the plus and the minus is just polarity, not a correction, it's just direction, not polarity. Um, if we have volts, then it will cause the amps to shift and start rising later. So that they're out of phase, and we'll talk some more about out of phase. And you don't have to remember that it makes the amps late. You do need to remember that the volts and the amps will not rise together. They won't cross the lines you know, at, the, at zero at the same place if, if XL is very big. Capacitive reactance is abbreviated XC. Its formula is very similar in that we have 2 times pi times F and times C, which looks a lot like this up here, except C is the size, C is the size of the capacitor in farads. There's some guy named Michael Farad, Faraday, sorry. And there was also somebody uh, whose last name was Henry. In any case, you'll notice that it's the reciprocal here, that X sub C, or capacitive reactance, is 1 over 2 times pi times F times C. You'll notice that we have frequency in both of these formulas, except in this case, when this number here gets bigger, 
that's going to cause XC to get smaller. So actually the larger the capacitor gets, the, the uh, smaller the capacitive reactance gets. I'll draw you a picture here. Let's say we have an alternating current power source and we have a capacitor. Capacitor is typically a couple of pieces of metal with some goop in the middle called an electrolyte that has very high resistance. So if the electrons start out from this alternating current power source in this direction, they're going to tend to fill up this side of the capacitor. The electrons on the opposite side of the capacitor get sucked up into the other side of the alternating current generator and turn it into being positively charged. Once this gets full and the capacitor can't hold anymore, no electrons can go in here anymore. It'll only hold so much. However, if we made this a really, really, really big capacitor, really, really, really big, by the time this part of the sine wave right here occurs, this first part of the sine wave, this is the electrons going in one direction. If this time period for half of the cycle occurs and the capacitor hasn't filled up yet, then electrons were allowed to come onto this side of the, this plate and electrons were sucked off and go back to the alternating current generator and we didn't really affect the circuit when the lines of flux, when the electrons get pushed in the opposite direction, that is when they go in the opposite direction, they can do that. These negative electrons will certainly go and fill in where there's not enough and if we're trying to pull the electrons in to this side, that means at that moment this side of the generator is positively charged, certainly these negative electrons would be happy to go. So if the capacitor is big enough, then it doesn't affect the circuit. But if the capacitor is really, really small, and this capacitor gets filled up in just a short period of time, the amps will go and then they'll drop. They'll go down to zero because this plate is full and it can't hold any more electrons. So you can see that if it's a really small capacitor, it'll affect the circuit a lot. If it's a really big capacitor, it won't affect it much, if at all. So when I go back to that, here we go. See what I'm talking about? Oops. If capacitor is small, the smaller the bottom value, the uh, the numerator, the smaller this gets, the larger capacitive reactance gets. But if C is really, really big, say 500 or say 5,000, then 1 over 2 pi f times 5,000, this gets really, really small. So the larger the capacitor, the smaller capacitive reactance gets. And it affects the phase shift in the opposite direction. If we have volts going up, the amps came up first. So it has volts late. Again, I'm not going to worry about whether you know volts or amps being late, but it's going to cause a phase shift between the volts versus the amps that is the opposite to the phase shift that is caused by XL. So you do need to know that the phase shift caused by XL and XC for volts and amps they're opposite to each other. So if we have a lot of capacitance or, or a small amount of capacitance in the circuit, XC will be big. And XL, if we have a large amount of Henry's or the big inductor, the size of the coil, then XL will be big. And they both cause phase shifts and they're both measured in ohms. Impedance. Impedance is the total opposition of current flow in an AC circuit. Here's the formula. You need to write it in. Z equals the square root of all of what's underneath it. R is for resistance. It's squared. And then before you square the XL and the XC, you subtract one from the other. So that makes you think that, oh, wow, if XC is a certain value, say 10, and XL is a certain value, say 10, then their effects would cancel each other out, and that would actually make Z smaller. If this was 10 minus 10, that would equal 0 squared equals 0. So effectively, this part would be out of the equation, and the only thing that would be impeding or trying to stop or oppose current flow in that AC circuit would be resistance, probably just of the wires. In an AC circuit, Ohm's law 
is a little bit different. Ohm's law in an AC circuit is volts equals current flow times impedance. Because now in a DC circuit, or correction, in an AC circuit, we not only do we have to take into account resistance like we do in a DC circuit, we have to take into account capacitive reactants and inductive reactants. So you can see that the three factors that directly affect Z are resistance, capacitive reactants, and inductive reactants. And just so you know, you could reverse this and make this XL minus XC, and you'd still get the same answer. 10 minus 5 equals 5, and of course you're going to square that, equals 25, or if you had 5 minus 10 equals minus 5, but minus 5 squared still equals 25. So it doesn't really matter which order this is in, XC or XL. Now here's a rather interesting graph. Oops. This is frequency. That's one factor that affects both XL and XC. But XL equals 2 pi FL. So as L gets bigger, XC gets bigger. As frequency gets bigger, XL gets bigger. So as frequency gets bigger, here's this line. This must be XL. And of course, XC is the reciprocal. 1 over 2 pi F. C and of course as frequency gets bigger XC is going to get smaller so as frequency gets bigger XC is going to get smaller so this descending line must be XC and of course we're talking about measuring this in ohms now this point right here in an airplane electrical circuit we're going to aim for things to be 400 Hertz at 400 Hertz the value of XC we'll say just for fun, is 5 ohms. But look, the value of XL, if they cross at the same place, then XL is going to equal 5. So if we plug the numbers in, Z equals R squared plus XC minus XL squared, this would be 5 minus 5, and that would be 0. So the resonant frequency here of an airplane circuit is f alternating current circuit is 400 hertz at that frequency most of XL and XC have canceled each other out yay so that means that Z or impedance will be at its smallest resonating circuit characteristics well here's our little formula there's X or rather our chart XL XC, here's our frequency, and here's ohms. Of course, we've got the formula for Z. We already know, already know the formula for ohms, or ohms law, in an AC circuit is I times Z equals E. And watts, the formula is the same. So in a resonating circuit, let's see how many characteristics I can come from up from. In a resonating circuit, the value of XC equals the value of XL. The effects of XC cancel out effects of XL. And these effects I'm talking about are one of them is phase shift. There is zero degree, now let's call it no phase shift. That is, the volts and the amps will rise up and down together. The volts will go up and down and the amps will go up and down and they'll cross zero synchronously. Oops, there we go. There's no phase shift. Alright, let's see. I know I can come up with a bunch of these. If XL and XC equal each other and these cancel themselves out so this turns into zero, then the only thing impeding current flow in the circuit will be resistance. So Z will be as small as possible. So Z is smallest. Oh, okay. Well, if Z is really small, then current flow is now dependent upon E. 
if we draw it like this, I like drawing Ohm's law like this. If Z is small and we have a constant voltage, we have a voltage regulator on our AC generator, if we have constant voltage but the opposition gets smaller, then current flow will get higher, A, B, C, D, E. So I, or amps, is highest. Oh, I got one more. Hey, P equals I times Z. E is going to be constant. We have a voltage regulator controlling our voltage. But if I gets bigger, if I gets bigger, then power, or watts, is going to get bigger. So P is going to be at its highest. So the characteristics of an AC or a resonating circuit are that the value of XC equals the value of XL. The effects of XC and XC cancel each other out. There's no phase shift. That means the volts and the amps are rising and falling together. Yeah, they're synchronous. Uh, impedance is going to be less than it would have been, or it'll be at its smallest. Therefore, current flow, if we have a constant voltage system, current flow will be at its highest, and watts will be at its excuse me, watts will be at its highest. So that's what we'd like in an AC circuit, is to have it be resonating or keep it at that one particular frequency that intersects both XC and XL. And of course for airplanes, that's 400 hertz. Okay, you ought to be able to do the practice questions, number 36 through 45. If you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. Make sure you can answer all the questions in the yellow pages for the test at the assigned date and place. Thank you.